Welcome to another kitchen sink clinic. I'm Casey Rochefort. I'm just doing my part to spread good information and dispel the uh, misleading information uh, regarding COVID-19. Uh, there are uh, videos and articles and of course rumors flying all over social media about um, the uh, man-made nature of COVID-19, which I, I went over in another video, which I'll, I'll direct you to, but in this particular context, I just wanted to go over why we know that COVID-19 actually does exist, because there are people that think it's entirely made up and people just have the regular flu, people just have colds, people die from this stuff all the time, so they're just calling it something new to get everyone scared, and huddled into their homes so they can wreck the economy and build a one world currency or something and you know the lizard people take over and everything like that and anyway i, I just wanted to go over uh a little bit of the science I'm, I'm going to explain science to you in a mega death shirt because science rocks um and basically i'm going to try to put it in layman's terms as, as much as i possibly can so you can really understand the nitty-gritty of how we know COVID-19 does exist, and how we know it is more than likely what's responsible for more than, you know, more than the statistical probability uh, of the deaths that are occurring. I'm not saying you can't have two different viruses at the same time, which you totally could, but uh, we know enough about statistics. We know enough about how disease works to say with a certain degree of confidence this is a real thing and this is really dangerous. There was a, a Journal of Clinical Microbiology article that had a lot of good information about this. Um, so uh, COVID-19 is novel. That means it's brand new. Uh, we've never seen this particular uh, set of mutations basically. So it's I mean, we've seen coronaviruses before, like SARS. It, it's, it's related to SARS. It's SARS-CoV-2, um, COVID-19. <clears throat> so anyway, it's going to have a lot of homology to uh, other SARS viruses. So uh, and what that means is uh, j just like you and your cousin share a lot of the genes, but you're very different, uh, COVID-19 uh, is very similar to, but also different from uh, previous coronaviruses that we've seen. Why this is important is because we don't have immunities to this yet. Whereas with the regular flu, which has been around for ages, we've got immunities when we're born from our parents, from their parents, from their parents before them. Uh, you know, we got vaccines. We've got all this stuff built up in, in our genetics to combat something like a regular influenza or a rhinovirus, the, the common cold. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I've, I've probably harped on enough about that. So I just kind of want to move on to uh, the, the tests that we have and that we've had in place since January, actually. Um, right, right now we're in, you know, kind of early April. And uh, there's another uh, paper from the CDC that explains some stuff. I'm going to go into both the JCM and the CDC uh, papers that I was uh, gathering some clips from, which I will put over here for you to read. And I will explain them. Don't worry. All right. So uh, one thing I, I came across was that there was a, an anonymous person uh, in the scientific community who said that we're not even testing the mean viral load. So, you know, you might have like one or two of these little virus dudes in you and it's not enough to make you sick. Well, I, I'm not even gonna touch the second part, but we are testing the mean viral load. Um, this is run through an RT-PCR, which is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. It's a fancy way of saying we take a little bit of something and we clone it a bunch of times so we can actually detect its presence uh, with uh, the sensitivity of our detection methods. And, and that's all it is, you know, it's, uh, it's 
this particular virus is RNA. And I've heard a lot of people referring to viral DNA. There are viruses that have DNA that's double stranded, but this particular one is RNA, one strand. <clears throat> so that's what we're looking for. I also wanna go into why this is definitely not just the flu and definitely not a cold. Uh, we know enough about these particular mutations in the nucleotide sequence that we can look at other things like influenza and match those mutations and see whether or not they exist in those. But on top of that, when we run a PCR, and specifically this RT-PCR in real time, which, which quantifies, real time quantifies that so you get viral load. Um, when we do that, we run a, a number of samples uh, against uh, controls. And uh, the positive control is COVID-19 itself. It, it's in, you know, an inactivated form that you resuspend and, and put it you know, very carefully into your you know, testing device and it will fluoresce and show up and say, here's what you have to compare to. Here's your positive control. And when the stuff uh, that you're running in the PCR gel from you know, your human sample lights up at the particular spot where the positive control lights up, you can match those up and say, okay, we definitively have it present here. There's also a negative control that tells you whether or not uh, some contamination may have occurred. And if that happens, and it can, because we're all humans and we do make mistakes, you just take more of the sample if there's some available and you rerun it and you're more careful this time. It's also possible that the sample was contaminated before you even got it, so it may have to be recollected. N nevertheless, there are people that are uh, implying that if we get this negative result, we're just going to call it positive or something. I don't, I don't know exactly what, what people are thinking science is all about, but uh, I, they tend to paint it as some kind of grand conspiracy that we scientists are just part of this global network out to get you. That, that was facetious. Um, anyway, where was I? Oh, there's one other control. Um, it's... Uh, it's called an extraction control. So if this weren't present, you might be able to say, oh, this sample came from the wrong place in a human, or it, you know, it's, it's not containing what we would need to verify the presence of the virus. Uh, that's the best way I, I think I can explain it. So I just wanna show you that you've got three methods of controls to tell you whether or not you can be confident in your results. And there's two things that we uh, are looking at when we're trying to determine that this is the virus. So I, I mentioned nucleotide mutations. So those mutations, uh, originally we were testing for three of them. Uh, this paper in the JCM was talking about uh, a method they've developed uh, just last month uh, that tests like seven to nine of these particular mutations. So you've already got uh, more statistical odds of being correct in your diagnosis. Quite a bit more, actually. Now, small as it may be, there is a chance that some other organism, some other virus, may have those particular seven to nine mutations. Now this is exceedingly rare. Like we're talking, you'd probably have better chances of winning the lottery to find this than to find this. But we test for not only that, but we also test for the presence of uh, just a coronavirus. Now you're probably saying, you're probably going to take that and run with it and be like, oh, we're, we're just testing if it's coronavirus then, right? And like, well, no, we know it's a coronavirus that has these particular 
mutations that are only present in COVID-19. So if we were just testing for the mutations, like I said, there's this tiny little chance that it could be anything with that mutation, right? Well, now you've got two different factors uh, that each are very narrowed down. Like it's not just a flu virus, it's not just a cold virus, it's definitely a coronavirus. And now it's not just some handful of mutations that could be in anything, it's mutations that happen to be on a coronavirus. And this is kind of like, you're looking up an old high school buddy. You're from Missoula, Montana or something. And his name is John Smith. And you're like, how am I gonna find John Smith? There's gotta be tons of John Smiths. Well, if you, you know, went to Google and started looking up John Smiths, what would be the first thing you would try to do? You would try to narrow it down by perhaps John Smiths that were from Missoula, Montana. And that's what we're doing here. We're looking for John Smiths, the mutations, that are from Missoula, the coronavirus. And that's all it is. You know, it's just another way for us to be really certain that what we're finding is a real thing. Pandemic that we're seeing, uh, and pandemics, by the way, I do want to note, have nothing to do with how many deaths there are. Pandemic just means that there's a worldwide spread of a particular disease. Now, the reason we're trying to take this so seriously is because we don't have that innate immunity, like I was talking about at the head of the, the episode here. This exemplifies the importance of vaccines. When a vaccine does become available for this, we need to be ahead of the curve and trying to squash all the anti-vax rigmarole that's in inevitably going to come out. It's probably already trickling out. Uh, and you really need to go get vaccinated and create a herd immunity because as we're seeing, this is demonstrated now, uh, people with poor immune systems probably will die if they get it. And if the herd immunity is out there protecting them, then we don't have to hide indoors and we don't have to shut businesses down. We don't have to disrupt the entire global life pattern. So get your vaccinations. Uh, this is a PSA to just go out and get vaccines and stay on top of the boosters and make sure you're protected because it's not just you you're protecting, you're protecting other people. All right, now I'm done. Have a good day.